Hey guys, it's Jennifer with the Shooter's Mindset. We are live with episode 348 of the Shooter's Mindset. We've got Adam Peeney as our guest here tonight. How you doing, Adam? Fantastic. A little behind the eight ball. Still got to load ammo for Alabama this weekend, but I still got time. I just finished mine tonight. Now I, I'll get to it at some point. <laughs> and we got our co-host tonight, Greg Cannon. How's it going? Hey, everyone. All right, we'll go ahead and jump in. So Adam, for anybody that's unfamiliar with you, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into shooting. Uh, so my name's Adam Peeney. I am the business development manager for KGM Technologies. We're a suppressor manufacturer out of Norcross, Georgia. We also do a number of other things. Uh, we're an R&D facility for a variety of outside companies. As well as we do some stuff for the DOD, we also do uh, in-house coatings, everything from uh, surface treatments and surface conversions to nitriding and a bunch of other stuff. Um, that's kind of, that's our company as a whole. We do on average 18 to 22,000 silencers a month in manufacturing. So we do a significant amount. Uh, we OEM for uh, uh, several companies. Uh, it makes us the largest in the country when it comes to suppressor manufacturing. And we've learned a lot and we pride ourselves on being experts in a lot of things when it comes to suppressors. Uh, myself, I've worked in the firearms industry for 13 years now, probably 15 if you count working in gun shops. I've worked for a variety of different companies uh, in my time. Uh, everything from Knights Armament, LWRC, uh, American Defense Manufacturing, just to name a few. I bounced around for a long time and found my home here, and I've been here for several years, and I, I truly, truly love it. Uh, suppressors are a huge passion of mine. Uh, medically, I, ha I shoot cans just to allow me to enjoy shooting. Uh, unsuppressed rifles really kind of mess me up. So we'll get into that a little bit down the line, some of the medical stuff we'll talk about. Uh, Originally, I was in the trap skeet and sporting clays. I shot uh, that for a very, very long time. And several years ago, I got into PRS, actually really long time ago. My PRS number is like 269, so it's a three digit. And got out of it for a while and then jumped back into it two years ago and started competing again and truly love it. And I totally forgot how awesome the people are and, you know, rebuild our project or our products for the end users and they try to be the best that they can be for the job that they have. They're not a, a catch-all, they're really designed to be perfect for the application they were intended to, or intended to use. That's awesome. So you've been around, What? how did you exactly get into your current role with KGM? Uh, so, when I left Knight's Armament, um, I kind of bounced around and did some uh, some consulting. Like I said, I've been around. I know a lot about a lot of things. Um, I pride myself on trying to be intelligent at the things I'm really interested in. I'm pretty stupid in a lot of stuff, but the things I know, I'd like to think I know. Um, and I work, uh, Kyle Grob, who is our one of our owners, has uh, been a buddy of mine for a long time. And I was helping him on uh, a suppressor project just as a consultant and we got our heads together because I was realizing that traditional suppressors, there's a lot there that actually has a detriment inside precision rifle shooting, especially when you compare it to shooting with a muzzle brake. You know, I found myself always being behind the power curve. Uh, if I'm shooting a skills barricade, I can't recover as quick with a traditional can as somebody shooting a really good muzzle brake like uh, a 419 Sidewinder, uh, an APA Fat Bastard, um, Clay and Tate's new muzzle, uh, muzzle device, like those really good brakes that work well to keep the gun neutral. Traditional cans, because there's no way to vent pressure, they trap it, they increase your dwell time, so it elongates your recoil, thus making the shooter feel like there's more recoil there. And you're getting a lot more muzzle movement. So if a traditional break, if you break a, you know, pull a trigger, 
break a shot on a barricade, you might have, you know, half a mil of vertical movement with a traditional can, you're probably going to have, you know, close to three mils of vertical mu muscle movement. So you just can't recover fast enough. You're generally not able to see trace as often. Uh, if you're in a really bad spot and you're not applying fundamentals, you know, chances of seeing where your uh, round impact either on plate or off, you know, goes out the window, being able to spot plate or plate movement. So if I bang a target when dropped and I hit the left side, you, know, you can't really pick that up. By the time you recover, the plate's already starting to become neutral. So we worked together on the R65, which was our first can of how do we make this thing work with recoil, accuracy, and sound pretty much being the last thing. Sound we knew would eventually come, but it just, it wasn't high on the priorities. We wanted it to be as close to a muzzle break in performance and recovery as we could while still maintaining all those positives of a suppressor and reduce sound, reduce concussion, um, while still being able to shoot and still being able to see all those things that are important for us as shooters. So that's, that's how I got into it. Uh, I was consulting for a while and then they asked me to come on board and talk to the wife and prayed about it, uh, we made the jump and moved up here. She ended up getting a job at KGM uh, a week after me and she's now our head of compliance. So I you know, run in the gray most times between you know, getting in trouble and not. And she's the one that keeps me out of trouble. I like them compliance people. I'm manager of regulatory affairs where I work. Oh, y'all are the meanest folks ever. You don't ever see the gray. It's black or white. And it's like, well, I mean, until it's not. It is, because you know what? The State Department, they'll shut you down or they won't. There is oh, I know. no, oh, we'll just let this be great. But that's what's great about you guys is, you know, they keep us in line. Like I get it twofold because, uh, you know, I get it at work and I get it at home. I'll never forget one time I was out doing some uh, machine gun testing and I came home instead of going back to the office because it was late. And she walks in, she's like, why is there a 240 belt fed in our foyer? I was like, I'll get it home tomorrow. She's like, did you at least book it out? I was like, yeah, I booked it out. I got the form too. Like we're covered. She's like, good. That was hilarious. Never know what you're going to have. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the history of KGM. How did it get its start? Uh, so that's, uh, that's a really interesting story in and of itself. Um, the company as a whole has existed uh, right at about nine, 10 years now. Uh, initially, Kyle Grob, you know, he, he was the founder. He was the one with the vision. Uh, he comes from a uh, nuclear welding background. Uh, he was in charge of fixing, uh, welding, and repairing old nuclear reactors. Um, so he was really, really smart when it came to the welding side of things. Uh, that'll tie in when we get to where we are now. Um, he opened up his own machine shop, got into doing race car fab and stuff like that. But being a gun guy, he was like, you know what? I'm going to start playing around with suppressors. He's also had a really weird infatuation with titanium. Uh, titanium is a great material. Its strength and weight properties are off the map. Uh, its thermal dynamics are really impressive as well. So the ability to uh, heat up uh, quickly but consistently and then dissipate that heat rapidly, uh, there's really nothing that can meet that material. So he started uh, building cans and they were, they were big. They were meant to be quiet because the material, they were lighter than most in that class. I think the old uh, Rogue 338s were one of the si uh, quietest 338 cans ever made. So he got tied in doing that. He made, uh, it was called KG Made then. Then KG Made became an actual suppressor company, but he would do contract work for other companies, weld studies, stuff like that. We picked up a big OEM contract and started manufacturing a large volume of suppressors for another company. And in that time have since evolved to KGM Technologies because we do so much more than just suppressors. Like I said, uh, coatings, R&D, OEM manufacturing, we'll do more than just cans. We do uh, stuff for the BMX industry, uh, stuff for the fashion industry, automotive. Uh, so it opens us up to a much broader 
clientele, some that may be not so big on the gun stuff and some that are big on the gun stuff. It just, um, think of it more like L3 Technologies, you know, they're a co big company. Everybody knows what they do, but their name's very autonomous. That's pretty cool. Greg, you got any lives? I can't see anything over there. I just said a lot of stuff. That's all I got right now. <laughs> Oh, my, my, my. So, what sets KGM suppressors apart from others? Like you said that it helps decrease, because I've shot suppressors before, and I have a hard time shooting them in competition because mm -hmm. the amount of um, the elongated recoil, I wouldn't say yep. it's more recoil, it's just different, and the longer yep. impulse makes it really hard to stay on target. So what sets KGM suppressors apart from others? Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, you, what you've experienced is not uncommon. Uh, it's something I've fought my entire life. You know, uh, I've had a bunch of concussions, so shooting unsuppressed is not an option for me. Uh, but what sets our cans apart is it was driven by people that understood the end goal and understood what, you know, what the application was. Uh, so our first cans were uh, R65, so it was built around 6.5 Creedmoor bolt gun, uh, either a competition gun or a law enforcement rifle. Those were what it was built around. So the first thing was, how do we uh, reduce muzzle rise, reduce recoil, and make it so that it's adaptable for every person? Because how I like recoil is probably different than you. You know, what I visually like to see is totally different than most other folks. So our first, uh, the thing that really set us apart, it's called the APEC. Uh, it's our adjustable port end cap. So this is an R6, uh, it's a six millimeter can. It's uh, five and a quarter inches, it weighs eight ounces. So it weighs nothing. Um, as pressure runs through, you're gonna have two pathways, one through the aperture. So your projectile is going down with all that pressure behind it. Once that pressure enters our, ba our blast baffle, some of it's bled off and diverted through the body. So as it goes down, both of those uh, pathways are gonna hit the apex, which basically has a reverse three prong that's kind of spun. So it's gonna vent all that pressure out of the 10 radial ports. We took it another step further, as you can see kind of each one you can plug off. So you can tune this end cap for how you want. Some guys run them wide open because that's what they like. Me, I generally will close off the bottom two because I want the gun to be a little bit snappier in recovery. So it's a little bit quicker for me. But that was the thing is I can make it one way and it's, you know, you just kind of take what you can get or you can make it tunable and make it so everybody will love it. I know guys that'll do, you know, close the bottom, they'll close one at the top or close three at the top where they just have their side ports it works for everybody. And the cool thing is uh, the way it's threaded on the back end with the mount, you can move the gun to gun to gun to gun. And at some point you're always either gonna have a port clock directly at 12, or you're gonna have two directly at 12. So always give you an equal number on the bottom. So it'll always work really, really well. This one came off of my wife's 6GT. So it's got two at the bottom and the clock's two at the top. And that's just the way she likes it. Um, suppressors really, especially in pre precision rifle, um, we shoot these big recoiling calibers, not that they're big, but we shoot so many rounds um, that most guys are worn out, you know, end of day one and they feel like crap end of day two because you're constantly getting hit with all that pressure. Um, being able to cut that concussion down, cut the noise down and make all that pressure work for you ends up being a huge benefit. So I don't find myself being uh, any more behind the power curve. Uh, the reason I miss shots is because I either make bad trigger pulls or bad wind calls. It's not that I, you know, this isn't causing it. I don't have that excuse anymore. If like, you know, I broke a shot and I went three mils high and I got no clue where, where it went. You know, I can watch trace all the way into the target. I can see when a plate moves. Um, I don't, I don't have that deficit now against muzzle brakes. And what's neat and weak because of some of the testing uh, features that we have in our facility. Um, 
we can prove down to a single Newton uh, what our cans will do in terms of recoil reduction. So on like a 300 Norma, uh, I think we reduce uh, from bare muzzle to a can on, you get something like a 38% in recoil reduction. When you compare it to, I think we did it to the standard Barrett brake, our can was actually like four or 5% softer in recoil than a brake. Most people assume that muzzle brakes are softer in recoil, but the problem is you're making that assumption in a time of chaos with the bang and the concussion going off. So your, your perception's really kind of off. When I slap it into a vice that measures unbelievably accurate, both fore and aft in recoil, I can, I can tell you without a doubt what it does. And it's not biased. It's, <laughs> uh, the machine is several hundred thousand dollars. It's super expensive to produce data that you can't argue with. And at the end of the day, that's gonna be the more valuable thing. That's really awesome. I love when, you know, some people out are out here and they're like, oh yeah, you know, my product A is the best because it feels better. But like yeah. when you actually, you know, go and do the scientific experiments and prove without a doubt that, some, <clears throat> you know, does something, that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. Yeah. And there's amazing products out there. Like I've shot some great muzzle brakes, you know, or I've seen some great muzzle brakes being ran on there. I've seen some pretty poor ones that people claim do a lot that they really don't. Um, and then cans are the same way. There's some that just do really odd stuff when you shoot them. Um, and there's some that are pretty, pretty simple. Um, another thing that we focused on was uh, maintaining or improving system accuracy. The last thing I ever wanted was to spend you know, several thousand dollars on a really nice rifle put a can on it to have to tune my ammo to suppressed or unsuppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take one of our cans, we uh, you will never have to change your load. You could, we'll, ha we'll have it this weekend in Alabama. Um, guys can spin their brakes off, put a can on, they'll have no change in zero and their data won't change. We've had zero, we've tested these out to a mile and had no POI shift. Like it's, if it's there, it's so small that you can't shoot inside that difference. Um, concentricity wise is another or concentricity is a big thing for us uh, if you ever want to see something interesting spin one of these on a lathe um, and compare it to other people you'll see some that have you know 15 plus thou run out uh, the max allow that we do on ours is seven thou and that's from the mount that is a secondary piece to the front of the can so it's super straight uh, what that gives you is as your projectile is going through Pressure is rolling through equally. There's no hidden pockets uh, in the can, and there's no way for suppressor boost to happen. Uh, suppressor boost is terminology for traditional cans. As your bullet goes down, these little pockets of air pressure throughout the can are going to act like a uh, slingshot and start making the gun or the projectile faster. Because ours vent pressure and because of how concentric it is, we don't experience that. That's awesome. With the um... projectile faster. Because ours vent pressure. Oh. Hey, if you do that, mute it so that people can't uh, <laughs> hear you back. Um, it was me, but you can't mute it till you get on there. I'm trying to look at all the comments because I swear to God, if Prentice doesn't stop, I'm going to kill you next time I see you. <laughs> I can't go through the comments on my phone because they're so muddled up with Prentice. Yeah. Prentice, are the scores posted yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I see steam coming out of her head. I'm gonna post something in a minute. I can't even go through the thing. <laughs> um, is is that your uh, BRA behind you? Yep. Uh, so uh, I work for KGM, but I shoot for some amazing companies that I'm truly blessed that they decided to support and back me. Uh, I shoot for Leupold on their pro staff. Uh, Redbeard Gunworks does all my gunsmithing. Um, shoot for Foundation Stocks. Uh, Kyle's or sorry, John Kyle. Um, the truest themselves, they're some of the most amazing people I've ever met. I also shoot for Alpha Munitions. I run their brass. But yeah, um, my main two match guns are either a 6GT or mainly it's been 6BRA this year um, <clears throat> and shoots great. Uh, I'll dive back in the cans for a second. Uh, so we're actually one of the only companies that do a dedicated six mil. I noticed. And if you ever, so if you go on our website and you look at the specs, you'll see the calibers they can handle 
then there's a section called optimized calibers. So when we started on the 6.5, it was built around 6.5 Creed to 6.5 SOM, 6.5 PRC. Those were the calibers we tested and developed that can around. When I made the switch and started shooting uh, BRs, BRAs, and dashers, it wasn't working enough. It, the can works really well, the harder you push it. The more pressure you can put in, the better it performs. Um, so we went down, developed the six millimeter. So this one is built for your BRs to your six GTs. It'll run whatever you throw at it. I mean, I'm getting ready to build a six millimeter PRC that this will handle all the pressure on. Uh, the 30 cal can, um, it was built for, you know, it'll run 22 all the way up to 300 Norma. Uh, it was built around 308 to 300 Norma. Those were the optimized calibers, the ones that we shot, that we tested on, that we wanted them to perform the best on. Um, you know, most folks may not know unless they spend a lot of time, but if you spend enough time and I give you, you know, six, five and you put it on a BR, you're like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. And then I give you this, you're like, whoa, that's, that's different. The gun recovers better, recovers a little faster because I'm pushing it harder with the appropriate amount of pressure for the size of the can. That's awesome. And that's something I, I just learned to think. Yeah. That's the cool thing about doing this show. Sometimes, a lot of times I learn all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, Chad Heckler was asking how many rounds are on your BRA now? Uh, which barrel? So uh, <laughs> this is barrel barrel two for the year. Um, I got 2,500 out of my last one. Uh, this one, it's still early in its prime. Like this one's only got 800 on it. And then I've got a, a new one sitting in the wings. For AG Cup. Nice. That's pretty, pretty good barrel life. Yeah. Um, I, for some reason, this, this barrel specifically, uh, it likes to be fast. So I shot the high node and the low node of this gun. And the low node was really good. I mean, I, I'd, I'd take it to a match any day. But the second I got in the high node, it shot some of the best groups I've ever had. And I had to make a personal distinction of like, is that the gun that likes this or is it me that likes a faster dwell time gun? So I did some like personal experiments shooting um, 22 long rifle, six BR going slow, uh, six Creed going fast and sat there and shot them all and kept shooting groups. And the ones that I ended up shooting the best groups um, with the least amount of effort where the cartridge is running faster. So I don't like being fast. This one's running a 105 at like 2920. Uh, that's really screaming fast for me, uh, but it shoots good. It stays out of pressure. The Alpha OCD brass, it doesn't really care about pressure. Um, and it just, it's working for me. I've had shot this one in the last two, uh, two days and I've done better than I have for the rest of the season. So we'll see how it rolls. That's awesome. I'm, that that's real cool that it's doing that good and lasting freaking forever. I wish I had anything yeah. that long size for a twenty two barrel. Yeah, um, it, 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 barrel calibers are interesting. I mean, everybody shoots a lot of different stuff. I mean, guns now are so accurate; it's really hard to pick what's better than others. Um, especially when you get into the BR variants, you know, BR, BRA, Dasher. Um, it really came down to, like, I, I chose BRA because I didn't want to deal with uh, fire forming Dasher. And this was before I, I, the guys at Alpha helped me out. So I was like, oh, I just, you know, I can put BR in, pull a, tri pull a trigger, and it'll fire form. So I can shoot a match and fire form at the same time. And I just truly loved it. But if you can't reload, you know, you're going six Creed and you're dealing with, you know, 11 or 1200 round barrel life, and that's it. Yeah, that's. That's sweet. Um, Snipe Bill just asked if you are going to be at Gap Grind. Uh, it depends on some military stuff that I have. I will for sure be at Gap next year, but it's a 50-50 on if I'll be there this year. Uh, KM is not too far of a drive, so I may come out for one day just to hang out and see everybody and you know, help out if I can. So the answer is, 
I don't know, but <laughs> check social media. We'll probably post something if myself or Scott go out. Awesome. Right. Ryan Allison said, bring one of these for him to try this weekend. Always. Uh, so if I'm, if you ever see me at a match, it doesn't matter if it's a one day or a two day, I always have, you know, four or five spare cans on me. Uh, I keep a variety of different mounts. So like I'm a three quarter 24 guy. If you're a five eights guy, like i I cover bases. Um, I've had plenty of people. Um, one I can quote, uh, Keith Lane. He took his break off at War Rifles, put a new 30 cal on there, no change at zero, shot the dope, shot the whole match, you know, got it back. And, you know, he was like, I feel great. You won't have to change anything. So if somebody wants to play around with a can, we can always shoot them on practice day. Uh, if you want to shoot them for a match, shoot them for a match. I want people to understand there are more options out there. Uh, technology continues to change. Cans get better, uh, not just ours, but others. Um, shooting suppressed is not only really nice for everybody around you, but it's actually better for you uh, health-wise at the end of the day. So I'm trying next year to hopefully do a suppressor-only match. Uh, I've been talking to a few MDs that are super interested. So it'll be something that I don't care what can you bring, just bring a can. And if you can't, I'll have one there for you. That would be awesome. That is cool. So what are the health benefits of a suppressor? Uh, so uh, a lot, actually, um, you watch anybody shoot with a break, you can see all the concussion coming out of it. When you pull a trigger, your most shooters are either one of two things. They're either mouth open or mouth closed. If your mouth closed, easiest pathway up is through the nose, direct shot into the, you know, into the brain, but yeah, I need working on not swearing. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> it messes with, uh, your sinuses. Uh, it messes with your equilibrium. It's intense pressure to your head, your skull, your brain, uh, all your neck tendons, everything. We did some pressure testing with 50 cals uh, up at Camp Atterbury earlier this year. Um, an unsuppressed 50 will impose 18 PSI at the center of the shooter's head. And that's with a 28 inch 50 cal barrel. So you're putting, yes, it's a lot of pressure, a lot of recoil, but it's still far enough away. We put a can on it, we ran our 50 cal can, it dropped it down to 1.5 PSI. That's a huge reduction. That's a huge amount of pressure taken away from you. Um, there's a big study right now, especially on the mill side, for TBI, uh, especially when it comes to pressure uh, related incidents. So flashbangs, machine guns, um, sniper rifles are a big thing. That constant impulse pressure every single time you pull it, it's messing with your brain upstairs. So uh, I'll gladly supply you guys with some uh, data that we've done as well as data that we have helped with. That way we can get it out. I, like I said, at the end of the day, even if you don't buy our cans, shooting cans, period, is just, it's better for you in the long run. Um, so myself, what you're saying is we all have an excuse. 100%. For so all I'm, our brain moments because yeah. it's from shooting. So here's the thing. No, no, not all of us. Some of us, it's just age. I, I'm, I'm getting up there too. But no, seriously, think about it. You shoot unsuppressed. How do you feel in the end of day two? Or sorry, well, you know, practice day and then two days in the match. How are you feeling when you're driving home? Worn out? Exhausted? How many times have you went, left the match on day one, went back to the hotel and you were just beat tired? Shoot suppressed. I guarantee you it's different. I can go back answer emails, function like I normally do because I'm not worried about beating the ever-living life out of myself. Uh, I can't shoot unsuppressed because of uh, I've had three concussions in my life. So I shoot unsuppressed. I get unbelievably bad mental fog, uh, terrible, terrible migraines. And to the point where like, I'll sit down and you're like, you okay? And I'm like, I just, I need a minute. And I, I, I can't process anything. Um, Spencer Berry is another one like that. Um, that's actually how me and Spencer became friends. Because he was the only other guy I saw, you know, match in, you know, every time shooting suppressing. And I was like, well, why do you do when you, know, you can shoot a break? And we talked about it. And I was like, man, I'm not the only one. And mine came from stupid stuff like football, lacrosse, and, you know, hardcore music at concerts. Like, you know, he has a much more, uh, you know, 
interesting experience when it comes to his, but it affects us all differently. And I don't know about you. I like coming home after a match and being able to love my wife like I want to and play with my dogs and just live a life and not worry about having a headache or being a little bit slow or, you know, having a bad night's sleep. I just want to continue to be me every day and shooting suppressed allows that. I mean, look at all the guys now that are going to them. They're performing as good on day two as they did on day one, or they're able to build and steamroll on day two because they've got that energy. They've got that faster mental processing speed. Um, I, uh, there's a thing called mental load. Mental load is what your brain can handle. You know, if it's got 100% capacity, inside it is what it can handle. So shooting a rifle, you've now got wind, data, all that stuff then it is dealing with that extra percentage on the back end of concussion, noise, blast. How many times have you shot inside a pipe and eaten concrete dust? Take all that out. You can now operate on a higher mental level so that way you can make smarter decisions shot to shot without worrying about getting beat up. You know, you, your days of having a flinch because of that bang go away. Dave said three concussions, them are rookie numbers. I know. I will not be getting those numbers up, though. <laughs> You're fine with being a rookie on this one? Yep. I'll, I'll absolutely tap out on that one. Um, I don't want to, you know, taste sound, and I, I, I'm cool with where I'm at now. I can, I can process and function on, like, a solid eighth grade level most days, so we'll keep it there. <laughs> That's funny. Every, every time uh... – Every time you start talking about concussion and this and that and the other thing, I'm just having like horrible flashbacks to the time is like, as I was pulling the trigger, my ear fell off inside of a pipe and oh God, that was horrible. Oh, I love Alabama because there's, you know, the stages are spaced out enough. Uh, this earlier this year, I shot with Matt Partain, Matt shoots suppressed. And because both of our last names start with a P and we were spaced out enough, we'd both take our ears off and just go shoot on suppressed. And it was so great. You know, it just, it takes you out of that stress situation of like, oh, we're actually doing it to where you're just enjoying it and having fun. And like, I could come off and not have to worry about racing to get my, my ear pro back on. And we just shot like we were shooting, you know, any old weekend. Mike said, wait, 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 Adam. So if I shoot a can, it makes me smarter. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's not going to make anybody dumber. And then Corey said that he's out of luck. <laughs> hey, uh, Corey's got a 30 cal coming. He can tell you how great, like, again, I, I, I love our products. I have a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into them. But even if you don't buy our products, shoot suppress with somebody. Um, Thunder Beast is an amazing company. Great product. Uh, Area 419, the Maverick, is a great product. Sounds of Omega. I mean, that was the can outside of like an Ultra 7 for a very long time. You know, their GSL makes good product. Those, those cans, just shoot and suppress will make it better. Yeah, there are some negatives, but like anything else, you're going to find some positives inside that as well. And we can always buy newer and better stuff. We're not, you know, running the same car all the time. Most people are getting a new vehicle every you know, five six years stuff like that so same with cans and cans purchasing suppression is actually going to get really really easy significantly soon um in october you're going to see some things come out of the atf that's going to make your wait times drastically less so that's about as far as i can get into it but uh the days of waiting a year to actually take this home are very close to ending that's awesome. Rudy asked what the uh, current wait times you're seeing are. Uh, this is going to sound super braggadocious, and I apologize. I don't know because I haven't filed for myself in a very long time. Um, I'm about to do it for a Thunder Beast Ultra 7. Um, so I'm assuming probably 9 to 12 months. Uh, it's when you buy NFA stuff, you buy it because you want it then you can afford it. And then randomly you're going to get a phone call saying you can take it home. And it's like Christmas in July. Mm -hmm. you know, I used, I used to always keep something, whether it was a form one SBR, a uh, short belt shotgun, a suppressor, 
I always had something and I would just forget about them. I see guys with these apps that track dates and it's like, why? What's it matter? Eventually it's going to come to you. So just wait for the random phone call from your dealer saying, hey, your stamp showed up. It's a surprise. You're happy. You go pick it up and you get to play with your new toy. Yeah, that's that's what I did. Last year, I want to say my weight was five five months about. So I mean, that uh, I'll never forget my first first stamp was a SBR. It was sixty one days door to door. That was back when you had to mail them. Like it was, it was so cool that first experience. And I had just turned like twenty one. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And it it's truly what ignited that love for. Uh, title two and nfa items um and it's something that continues to go for this day plus it's the historical stuff like i've got cans that are 10 years old i've got some old cans that are probably 20 30 years old but it's because it's what i like to collect and yeah it just if you like them buy them it's also your right you know if you live in a state that you can own them and exercise your right to that um buy a 22 can if you don't own one Tell everybody, first thing you buy is a 22 can. Mm -hmm. It is the closest thing to Hollywood quiet, and it's the most fun you can have when you pay it's on. Totally agree. I have more than one can, and my absolute favorite is my little 22 can there. Corey yeah. says if it doesn't go through, he's going to flog you. Oh, it, I'm, if he knows what I'm talking about, it's done. It's just when they decide to do it. That's I can't help with that. So, and I would like the flogging. So, is it really a negative? You've seen Corey's legs, and things are gorgeous. <laughs> oh now his head's going to explode. Yeah, could be worse. Yeah. Um, so, backing up a little bit, um, I know on your website you guys have like precision suppressors and full auto suppressors what's the what's the difference yeah uh so we break them up uh, kind of in a few different families so we have uh precision side which is all um you know precision rifles that stuff uh and then we have hard use which is the machine gun carbine side uh and it's really just again focusing on the application not trying to make one product that does you know it's like 80 percent good here it's like you know 30% good here. Yeah, you, we want this can when you buy it, you know, for a 5.56 five, bolt gun or a six millimeter arc to be the best thing at that job. While it is for that, it's not necessarily good for like a 10 and a half inch 5.56 five, carbine. So we develop products for that. Uh, the big difference is mainly in the materials we use. Uh, so the precision stuff is all mainly grade nine and grade five titanium, where our hard use stuff is built using high nickel alloys and steels. So it's a bit heavier, but it's meant to take that beating. Um, so this is our R556. This is meant to be ran on, you know, Mark 18s, 556 carbines uh, and stuff like that. Stuff that's short barrel, it's gonna be really abusive that you're gonna shoot uh, really fast for long firing cycle durations. Um, titanium is great, but it does have its flaws. Um, this will fail on a 5.56 carbine long before this will. Um, and then when you get out of that, you get into our more off book stuff. So we do some stuff with belt feds and some other things. And um, those are program driven specific, but yeah, it, that's really the difference is what's the application use and then the material inside of it. So like these cans are actually really identical uh, only difference is the aperture is slightly smaller in the material, but the six millimeter we learned it was great. Shoot it on uh, 18 inch 5.56s. Five, made some tweaks on the, on the internal to deal with that extra pressure of short barreled gas guns. Changed the material around, thickened up some of the baffles, um, and we went and made it our hard use line. One of the nice secondary benefits to the APEC is reduction in back pressure for gas guns. So if you ever shoot 5.56 five, or SR25s or any semi-auto gun, when you suppress it, you're increasing your bolt speed and you're increasing gas particulates that come back to the shooter. Uh, suppressors like ours and OSS, they vent that pressure out. OSS vents theirs completely forward. 
we vent ours to a 90, but it wasn't a primary reason. You know, again, our goal with the APEC was recoil reduction. The beautiful secondary benefit is that reduction in back pressure. So you could stay in the gun longer, you're not getting gas into your face, and you're not beating the gun up by overdriving it. That's a, that's kind of what I was thinking, um, but that's a great explanation of it. So apparently we stated an, act, an inaccuracy earlier. Yes, we said that the most fun thing that you could do or the most fun can you can have is on a 22, but Corey said that that is not true. He said a uh, full auto MP5 suppress is way more fun. So funny story. Guess what's going to be on the stage this weekend at Alabama? A full auto suppressed MP5? You dang right. You dang right. What? I think so. I'm bringing one. Uh, I believe it's going to be used on a stage, if not on a side stage. But yeah, I'm going to bring an MP5 with, with me. And uh, Jason at Federal is supplying the ammo. Uh, I was talking with Jim and I was like, hey, man, what can we do to have some fun? You know, we can only shoot PRS stages so many different ways. What can we do? It's a little different. And, was, and we just got talking. I was like, can I bring a machine gun? He's like, yeah. I was like, I don't care if we just do a, you know, a burst into a target at 10 yards. Like, it's something different. And again, you're right. Full auto MP5s are incredible, but still not as cool as suppressed 22s. I'm sorry, Corey. Oh, now I really wish I was going. Also, if you're ever in Augusta and want to bring a machine gun to my 22 match, go for it. Choi Long. Go ahead. No, go ahead and do that. No, I mean, you're not that far from me if you're in Augusta. I mean, we're only a little bit north of Atlanta. Nice. So Troy Lawton wants to know if someone were to buy a KGM six millimeter precision can, how many rounds approximately can we expect? Ex Tell Life. Troy to elaborate. Oh, lifetime? Mm -hmm. um, so I honestly don't know. I've got some cans that are well over 15K. Like this can I think is right at about 12,000. I clean it maybe once a year. Um, but there's no baffle erosion. Um, you know, suppressors are generally a lifetime uh, purchase. And one thing that we do a little bit differently is uh, where we actually place our serial numbers. So uh, well, uh, it doesn't matter. So we put the serial numbers in places where if we update your suppressor or you destroy the suppressor, we can lop it off at the weld, replace the entire front end, and it'll be basically a brand new can. Uh, the same with our 5.56s, five, we actually serialize the back end here so we can cut the weld, keep your serialized suppressor part, and put a whole, whole new front end on it, whole new baffle stack, everything. Um, so if we ever update products and you want to send it in, you know, if you've got a Gen 1 and you want a Gen 2, uh, or if you make a mistake and you destroy a can, the can's not really truly destroyed. We can always salvage it because the, the chances of you destroying or the back end of this is so rare because technically your muzzle is right here. The end of, you know, your crown sitting inside the can with enough space that your serial number will always be protected. So short term, um, I've seen well over uh, 15 on some of our test cans, but long answer is this will be the KGM cans will be a product that you'll have for life if you decide you want to have you know new baffle stack put on or an updated whatever cam will always be salvageable it'll always be repairable and it'll always be upgradable that's freaking awesome so are you coming to Alabama this weekend yeah yeah squad seven baby because Corey says he'll fight you little man and so I'm thinking Saturday night we just need to have a mud pit and let y'all go at it and we'll all bring popcorn. Yo, if somebody does a strawberry, strawberry jello, if you don't have a kiddie pool with strawberry jello, I ain't in. But if you do, I'm in because that sounds like a good time with Corey as long as he's wearing his shorty shorts. I don't think I'm, you could think you're going to weird me out. Can't. If nobody FaceTimes me during this event, I'm going to be overly upset. You know, Corey will not wear pants. So, oh, Corey just said naked. Um, is there a downside to any of this? Because I haven't seen it. I'm not sure that the precision rifle community is ready for that. 
I don't think we are. Mm-mm. I mean, we could probably put it on Corey's OnlyFans. <laughs> Adam, uh, uh, Tommy asked if if do you talk without your hands ever? Oh, I'm Italian. No, we have to. <laughs> like, sorry, it's it's the Italian in me. I learned it from my father, who learned it from my grandfather. It's just the way we are. All right, I have um, um, Jeff wants Does to know- have those scores yet because I'm waiting on them scores. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think we were mean to him and he went away. Um, Jeff wants to know what's the coolest can or project you've done and what is your favorite can? Uh, ooh. Coolest can uh, that I have worked on. Um, I unfortunately can't really talk about it. Uh, sorry that means um, it's super awesome uh it's a can that's not really built for our world but it just it truly cuts it changes what a lot of people think suppressors can do on machine guns uh and it's been amazing to be a part of that uh, and there's some other technology that we've got coming um but honestly the one that's always going to be close to my heart is the, is the first can we worked on uh the art the six five I had the original prototype. Uh, my last name is a serial number. Uh, it is the first one that we ever did. So all the end cap revisions. Um, I mean, I've met that can probably has 20,000 rounds on it. And you can take the back end off and see the carbon build up inside of it. But you just got such a great story. It's one that I will always keep in my safe until we eventually do like a, this is a history of our company thing. But uh, that that one will always be near and dear to my heart because it was cool to see an idea that I talked to Kyle about and I was like, hey, you know, is there something we could do? And then an hour later, he had this full CAD drawing of the first APEC and, you know, he made the can. I had it in like three or four days and I just started shooting. And the first time I put it on a on a tank trap and I think Corey has actually shot and play with this first can. And I pulled the trigger and I could watch my plate move and I, you know, I could see everything. It was just like, it works. And then it was just refining it and making it better until we found that point of like, the difference between good enough and perfect is a lot of time. Uh, good enough is a product that people can use, that they can work and that can always be updated. Perfect is something that sits in engineering hell and never comes out. Amen. Um, Jeff asked if you could kind of go over the process of tuning the ports. Like what, what uh, you have to do? Yeah, let me see if I have an Allen wrench set. So uh, when you buy a can, you actually get a really, really nice uh, nano carrying case and you'll get a sticker pack, uh, there's an Allen wrench and some set screws. So, sorry, my camera's not great. So see that top port? That's got a set screw in it. Um, they're actually cut on a taper, so you can't drive those set screws through. Me being, my, I earned my nickname, the science hammer, because if it can be broke, I'll break it. Um, I drove a screw all the way through, and I was like, uh-oh, how do we stop this from happening? Uh, Kyle was smart, and he was like, hey, we'll just we'll taper at the bottom. So you physically can't drive through it anymore. Um, so if we look to the next one, there is no uh, set screw in it. So looking from the muzzle, these ones are face down because when it go, the gun goes off, instead of 100% being directed 360 degrees, you now have 100% being sent up here. So the gun will recover the way I like it. Um, generally, if you go down in weight, up in caliber, you're going to see a huge benefit from t- tuning the ports. Um, I've got a, uh, what is that thing? I don't know. It's a nine pound carbon 6547. Um, it's a f- great gun to shoot, a lot of fun. Um, it shoots like a 6BRA because of the way I have it tuned. Um, I've got a carbon 6.5 PRC barrel coming. You know, it's going to be a lot more rowdy. Uh, really, I guess probably the biggest one is like my 300 Norma. It's not overtly heavy, but the gun shoots like a comped 308. And I'm shooting a 230 grain hybrid 
at 29.75. So it's got some open, it's moving. Um, that big 1200 yard plate at uh, Alabama, dude, I hit that like you're shooting a six Creed at 300 yards. Like it just hits the plate hard, but I can see everything. I can see trace. I can see, you know, where it hits on the plate. I don't lose anything. So tuning the ports on that really helps because the gun becomes predictable uh, and I don't have to work as hard at managing that maximum amount of recoil. Now, transversely, when you go into heavy, you know, 20 to 25 pound BRs, BRAs, you know, you can get away with less tuning. I know a lot of guys that run completely open ports. So that way the gun stays flat and neutral, doesn't recover as quick, um, in terms of like flatness, but the gun stays neutral and you know it just tracks straight back into you. So again, it's it's personal preference. Um, we have some content up on our YouTube uh, that goes over tuning the ports. Uh, and if you ever uh, ever see me, I'll gladly help you. And one of the cool things is that uh, it doesn't take a lot to make a big difference. I mean, if you have a gas gun, that when the gun goes off and reciprocates generally you see gas guns go up and to the right if you offset you know down to the left of the apex it'll flatten the gun out and it could be as little as one screw put into the uh, apex that's pretty pretty straightforward um so we just kind of talked about you know what the original can was or what y'all's original can was but how's technology and suppressors evolved over time? And like, you know, both like what has changed on the cans and then what has that changed with like the the decibel reduction as well? Because I know, you know, back in the old days, it was, you know, oh, you know, you can run a suppressor on your 308, but it's going to be just as loud as a nine. So you got to, you know, still wear your ears, whereas you're talking about shooting matches with no ears at all. Um, so really, like anything, technology gets better. So our testing equipment has gotten better. Um, for the longest time, uh, the old B&K single post uh, acoustic meters were what we used. Um, it was the industry standard because that was the most advanced system we had. Um, I give kudos to Ray at Thunderbeast uh, for, for bringing the pulse into our system or into our world. Uh, so B&K, um, they're all about measuring sound and impulse signatures. Uh, several years ago, they released the Pulse. It's a um, basically a, a data management system that wrapped around uh, impulse signature. He saw what that technology was and was like, okay, we can use it here. And the neat thing is instead of using a single uh, microphone post, it now you can use 12 different microphones on it and you can meter at a variety of different areas. Um, so you're getting a ton of data in. So, you know, a meter right of muzzle, meter left of muzzle, center of shooter's head, ejection port. Um, you can do all that at once, but what really made the difference was the actual recall, or sorry, impulse signature. So if you look at it, um, look at it on a graph, it'll do up and down. So the old B and Ks would measure basically the top quarter of the uh, advancing level and then down and back. So you're getting a small weighted version of what that was. So that's why guys were like 140 was the number. Like you have 140, that's what this says. That's what it was, it was way to go. That was the marketing hype. Um, now with the pulse, I get that full impulse signature plus 500 milliseconds before the shot. So I have a full spectrum view of the actual impulse signature. So now you get numbers that are higher, but they're realistic. Uh, if you take cans from, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago that were quiet by definition, and then when you put them on this new technology, they're going to meter at higher numbers because their technology's gotten better. So your can that might have been a 140 then, realistically, is probably a 146, a 147, an actual real DB, and, and that's been the biggest change. And the biggest improvement, because we look at this whole, you can stand a impulse signature of 140 dBs. Yeah, true, kind of. It, what is a true 140? You Most folks won't know, um, because what they have thought was 140 
realistically is not. So that has been truly uh, the biggest advance that I have seen because you're now able to meter for a variety of different areas at the, or at the same time, but you're getting a true picture of what a suppressor sounds like, what it's actually giving you. That's awesome. And I, like, I didn't even think about the technology that you use to make the technology evolving. Oh yeah, I mean, like for us, so much goes into it. Uh, 360 degree laser welding with vision tracking. Um, being able to, we have a recoil test fixture that looks like um, a big shooting rest that rolls on ball bearings. It's like 2000 pounds um, that we can strap the gun into. We can measure barrel harmonics. We can measure uh, recoil impulse, both fore and aft, uh, simultaneously doing our acoustic data while doing kinematics, which is high speed video. The technology has gotten better and better so we can truly understand what is happening at a system and a shooter level when you're shooting suppressed and unsuppressed. That's awesome. I want to come and play with something else toys. That sounds really fun. So Jeff Williams. I mean, asked, it's a drive up, man. Jeff asked a good question. He wants to know yeah. the tuning of the ports. Can you cover that? Like, how do you go about doing it? If you wanted to tune. I think we got that one already. Okay. So, well, I'll, I'll go into how I tune ports. Um, so I get on a bench. Um, I don't do this prone. I try to get as vertical as I possibly can. Uh, rear bag, bipod. I'm going to put a target at 300 yards. I'm going to get into the gun. I'll touch the butt pad to my shoulder, and I'm going to back it off. So I'm going to shoot it kind of free-ish. And I'm going to break a shot. And I'm going to measure in my reticle how much of the where the where it went uh, from that target. So if I'm centered and I break the shot and it tracks two mils up, but you know two mils left. Okay, cool. I know I need to pay attention to that side. So I'm going to start working on that side of movement, closing off port so it's overdriving the opposite. And then for me, I don't care so much about um, you know I'll, I'll get a little bit more vertical to get rid of all of my left and right. Because I know my data is pretty good on my guns, but wind is always my personal downfall. So I want the gun to be as stable left and right when I break the shot, uh, for me personally. Um, so I'm gonna sit there and I'm gonna tune the left and right out. The benefit is as I'm tuning the bottom, I'm gonna start reducing my vertical as well. There is a point of diminishing returns where you're gonna hit uh, by closing off more ports than you have open that you know, if I closed up all the way to here, this gun is going to do the most violent snap down you have ever seen. And that's because instead of 100% being sent 360, you now just have it being sent out of three ports. You're not losing that percentage, you're overdriving those three instead of having 100 come out of 10, if that makes sense. So I'll sit there and I'm just basically gonna free recoil and I'm just gonna measure my reticle, how much and where it moved from the center of that target. And that's how I tune it. And again, spend time with it because when I demo this to a lot of people, I'm going to have you shoot on a bench for a while and we'll sit there and we'll close them off until you're like, okay, that's perfect. Cool. They'll shoot a few more and then I'll take you to a barricade. And that's when you see it come together as an entire system um, where you see the concussion that doesn't affect you. It sees, you know, the same minimal movement that you would get on a break. Um, the same style that you would shoot as a break or as a break and it, when it all comes together in that beautiful ballet of perfection that's when you get the aha movement of like now i see what all this is about all right Oops. sorry i'm back um so you guys are huge supporters of the prs uh why did you guys choose to do this and what benefits are you seeing out of it uh, so KGM, uh, unlike a lot of other companies, um, we're all shooters. I mean, at a variety of different levels from executive to mid-level where I'm at to, uh, you know, our production guys. I mean, we've got hunters, we've got ELR shooters, uh, everything. Um, so to, uh, the second amendment, but really the shooting sports is, is huge for us. 
Um, I love precision rifle. I love the PRS. I truly believe that it is the most perfect uh, league that we have built by imperfect people because we're all imperfect. Um, and we wanted to give back. Uh, we wanted to show our customers and our future potential customers that, you know, we believe in our products. We believe in the sport. We believe that we can make a difference in a variety of different levels. Uh, so how can, you know, we're going to invest in this. Um, I will also tell you that being a sponsor, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, companies, guys like Jason from Federal, uh, Nick from Loophold, uh, anybody there that comes and shoots matches is going to get the most ROI out of being a sponsor. If you think just, you know, put your name on a board. Yep, it's cool. People see it. It's in photos, but you get nothing back personally. Like I can't sit there and show you how great I think my can is. And selling suppressors is like selling Lamborghinis. The sales in the test drive. Being able to be out there experiencing them, hearing them, watching them is what makes the difference. Um, showing people that there is another way to shoot. Um, being able to control our brand image and, and try to represent uh, my company and myself the best way I possibly can. So uh, we will continue to support the PRS, but you will continually see us at events. Uh, we did a lot this year. We'll probably do more next year, but that's uh, to get more out West and to, to bring that out there. Because at the end of the day, like I said, I'd love you to buy ours, but if I can just get people shooting suppressed, it, life becomes a whole lot uh, better for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, not only that, but just like for us shooters to develop a relationship with somebody from a company, you know, the people that we see at all the matches, like, if I have to go and, you know, I, we were talking about this earlier. I use Tom Fuller as an example. Pretty much every match I shoot, Tom's there. Tom's taking care of us. And if I have to buy a bag, I'm going to go to Tom for that. And then with me being the, you know, the shooting guy, and everybody knows I'm the shooting guy, if someone comes to me and says, hey, Greg, I need to buy a rear bag, I'm going to say, cool. Yeah, go to ArmageddonGear.com, order anything. Great stuff. And so that helps out. Yeah, I mean, and I'll be honest. It, I get to learn stuff as well. Like, um, I, nobody at our company claims to know everything. I mean, I learn things all the time from a lot of people and being out there with, uh, with my friends and making new friends because Precision Rifle is one of the most welcoming communities you'll ever, ever find. Um, I can learn things of like, well, maybe I didn't, we didn't think of that when we were designing this product. Let's take it into account. Um, you know, th those are, are huge, huge benefits. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll continue to do it. Um, and we're happy to do it. And it's also the difference between, uh, I'll use a car reference, a used car salesman and a car guy. Like, you know, a guy who's there because he's passionate about it. He loves everything there. And you also know the guy that's just there because it's a job and it's not for, for us. For us, it is truly important on a personal level. Uh, not only for our company, but for ourselves to you know, be involved and be experts at the things that we claim to be experts at. So Sean asked, I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, what's the outlook on transfer times? Oh, I can't. Uh, so once this thing happens and everything calms down, you'll probably be in the 90 to 120 days, I think, is the what I've been told. And he said... Yeah, this secret thing is happening. It's out there. You can absolutely go online and search ATF form fours and they made an announcement and just it's coming soon. And uh, it's honestly, it's going to be great for suppressor companies because you know, we'll sell a lot more, but it's going to be great for the community because there'll be more suppressors out in the world. You know, uh, how many ranges now are getting shut down because of noise complaints from neighborhoods that moved in after the ranges were built. I, I mean, moved in next to a gun range and now I hear gunshots. So if, if people are shooting suppressed, what's the argument? And it destigmatizes something that's basically a muffler. Like everybody thinks it's, you know, like machine guns, they're assassin stuff. It's like, no, it's not. It's not like you hear in the movies. It just makes the entire 
experience more enjoyable. And yeah, you know, I hunt suppressed. Uh, I shoot 22 suppressed. You know, anytime it's a gun going off, I'm, I'm running a can because I enjoy it. I can take my wife out and shoot. Um, you know, it, it just take kids out. It, women and children are probably the two that get the biggest benefit. You know, every time I go out and, you know, taking a nephew or taking a, a friend's kid or, you know, my wife or one of her friends, you know, you, you, you first shot that goes off and they're like, whoa. And I'm like, that's the worst it'll ever be. It's not like you thought it would be. You're like, I like this. And you now can bring, convert people that were either afraid or had some kind of preconceived notion about what the experience was or is and throw it out the window and totally change it but that's a saturday and somebody came in with their kids and i was laying down prone and i shot the first round and then they went and asked to move yeah i mean i'll be honest i i don't like shooting around i hate zero day on train up like i absolutely um I absolutely 100% will go as early as I can. So that way I can avoid everybody shooting breaks 100%. There, there's a picture somewhere of a couple of Marines laying next to Jen in a train up day like this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. And... I can't help it. It wasn't a train up day. It was during the match. Okay. Sorry. My, minor details. How um, awful is that when you have to shoot in a pipe for the, for the break? It's fucking terrible, especially when your ears fall off. And you just dosed yourself with 170 dB right to the skull? Huh? Exactly. What are the lives we got? Uh, let's go back over the lives. Um, we kind of covered this earlier. Um, Jeff want, Jeff asked about the changes in muzzle velocities with suppressors. So okay. I guess versus some other ones. Um, again, it just it depends on some. I can only speak from authority on ours. Um, I've never seen it. I've never seen a change in velocity. I've never seen a change in zero. Uh, I mean, I've shot with buddies that we took a can off their 308, went out to 1046, and stacked them right in the water line. Shot it over chrono, no change in speed. Uh, there are some cans that will produce suppressor boost. And like I said earlier, it's bullet going through the aperture, catching a pocket of pressure. And it's, uh, like I said, it's like a slingshot. It's going to add 30 or 40 feet per second which is going to change where your point of impact is, which is going to change your data. You know, if you're running a 105 hybrid at 28, 25, we'll say, and now you put a can on it, that probably weighs it, you know, a significant amount. That's going to change POI. But then you add that extra 40 feet per second, it's going to change that data. Um, because of our cans being so light, for them being so straight, and the fact that they evacuate pressure while reducing recoil, uh, we don't see those detriments. What else we got? Anything else live? I believe my lives are frozen for the moment again. Let me refresh. All right. Well, while you're looking at that, so Adam, what upcoming matches or projects or goals do you have both for you and for KGM? Uh, so match wise, uh, obviously Alabama this weekend. Uh, and then I believe I'll probably shoot the cool acres one day and probably Altus. And I think the last one for me will be AG cup. Um, I don't have, I will probably attend the finale just for like the last day. I have no interest in shooting in December in New Mexico at 7,000 foot elevation. I just, it doesn't particularly sound that fun. Not when I can use that same time to go hunting and do other things that are fulfilling in my life. Uh, 
goals for me is just continue to work with the amazing people that I work with every single day at work. Um, the people that it's kind of crap to call them clients when they're friends, uh, answering their requests and their needs and providing them with the solutions that they're looking for. Um, just trying to continue to do that every single day and, and push the boundaries of, you know, what suppressors can do and, you know, what it's going to be today will probably be a lot different in a year from now, probably two years from now as well. Like we're, everybody's pushing the bar, constantly advancing, um, the, the government, the mill, I mean, LE, they're all getting smarter. They're all seeing the benefits of suppressors. Um, and, and I love that. I mean, the harder questions they ask us, the, the harder we work and the better we get. So that, I guess that's, I guess that's the most direct answer in a long way I could give you. Sounds good. Yeah. Any more lives, Greg? Uh, let's see. Anthony, for those of you who know who that guy is. Um, who is that? I'm not, I'm not sure. Some, some guy named An Anthony Cruas. He said, Adam, you work for a lot of big name companies and he's convinced that the LWRC ARs are the best in the business. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so I like carbines. Um, there's a lot of great manufacturers out there to say anyone is better than the other. Um, it's a favoritism game at this point. I mean, you've got companies, uh, Knights Armament, Hodge Defense, uh, LMT, Noveski, LWRC, HK, Daniel Defense. I own guns from all of them and they all have their pluses and they all have their minuses. I don't think one is better than the other. Um, I own a lot of mine because of either, you know, because of the personal relationships I have with people there or the companies. Um, it just, it really comes down to what you're looking at. It's like, you know, if I want a hyper accurate uh, competition gas gun, I'm going to call Sergeant Arms and have him build me a 6GT gasser. If I want a combat proven, reliable 7.62 gun, I'm going to buy a Knight's SR25. If I want a, a modular uh, 5.56 gun, I have an LMT MWS, or sorry, whatever, MWS, they're large frame, but I have a, it's actually right there, the 10 and a half inch. Um, I want a piston gun, LWRC. I think they're one of the finer ones made. Uh, DD Mark 18. They're just, there's too many good ones. There's really nobody that in that tier of product and caliber of company that make a bad gun. So I guess that's, that's probably super politically correct, but it's the truth at the end of the day. Uh, you just got to figure out what your needs are, what you like, and what fits your budget. Um, some guns are built to be heirlooms that'll last forever. Some guns are meant to be high horsepower race cars that you don't get a couple runs out of it, and it's time to rebuild. Agreed with that. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a gun for everything, and that's why you need lots of them. Oh, I mean that's I mean look at actions today. I mean, you buy a center a good custom action, you know, prefits a, a big thing, you know, because if I want to shoot six GT or if I want to put a carbon six creed or i want to shoot six five forty seven i want to be able to switch those out in my house you know every action you know actions that are great you've got impact lone peak kelby's uh curtis i mean again pick what you like you want a 60 degree or a 90 degree do you want a combat proven ai i mean there's just what you're looking for at the end of the day i admittedly I'm an impact guy. I, I like the Oklahoma special foundations and impacts. Just that's what works for me. All right. Are we good on lives? Mm -hmm. I think we can wrap it up. We usually start with you with shout outs. Um, so, oh, you had my bad. Oh, uh, you go first. Uh, yeah, because you. You got to do the whole closeout and everything. Uh, so here we go. Uh, Adam Peeney, KGM Technologies. Uh, you can catch us on our social media, uh, just 
at kgm-tech. Our website is kgm-tech.com. Uh, lower cans, man. Uh, do you ever see me out? Please come by, say hello. If you want to try some, I've always got spare ammo and spare cans. Um, I, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank the people that take care of me. My wife being the first because I am a large man child and without her, I am pretty much useless. Uh, Loophole uh, Foundation, uh, Red Beer Gunworks, uh, Alpha Munitions. I, I thank them for their support and, uh, and, my, and KGM for letting me do what I do and try to have as much fun and be the hooligan that I am. How about you, Greg? What you got? I have uh, GSL suppressors back here someplace. Um, shooters and sharpshooters of Augusta, our local indoor and outdoor ranges. PDC Custom, the most beautiful rifle chassis known to man, available in lime green and normal human colors. Shooters World Powder, um, keeping my center fires fed. Hunter's HD Gold up here, helping my blind butt see the targets. And um, fix it sticks for putting it all together and taking it apart and then putting it back together again and taking it back apart and putting it back together. I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> I mean, how many times have you ripped it got apart? Oh my word, don't A ask. Lot. Oh, oh, I've done it end of day one sometimes and you know, you have good parts and stuff, it comes right back together and you don't gotta worry about nothing. Exactly. That's right. Until you have a part left over. Anyway, um, where was that? Uh, <laughs> and I just want to shout out you for coming on and spending like what an hour and a half, almost two hours of your Tuesday night with us. We appreciate you coming on and doing that. And we appreciate KGM supporting the shooting sports. And so with that, that'll be a wrap for episode 348. And we will see y'all next time.